Hello, I'm Anthony Smith. I'm a retired Special Warfare Boat Operator, also known as SWIC. I was a Chief Petty Officer in the United States Navy, and I'm here to talk about Operator Syndrome uh, as it pertains to SWIC operators and the long-term effects of traumatic brain injury and major orthopedic injuries. Okay, just a quick snapshot of uh, some things that are going to bring validity to this entire presentation. I was in the Navy, like I said, for actually for 24 years. Uh, my first 10 years, I was a fleet sailor. My last 14 years, I was a SWIC operator. I was in SWIC class 20 and I graduated back in 1996. SWIC is a special operations force tasked with maritime insertion and extraction of SEAL operators. We work with other special units, special forces, different groups, but primarily we work with SEAL operators. I've been on multiple, uh, multiple deployments overseas. <clears throat> I've worked for the last 36 years between DOD and DOS in roughly 42 countries. And uh, significantly, I have 10,000 plus hours on SWIC fast boats. That's gonna be very important. Uh, to to know and to understand as we move forward in this presentation. I have an estimated greater than 250,000 uh, whiplash related MTBIs from fast boat wave pounding. And that's based on the, the number of times you've been on deployment, your deployment cycles. Uh, when you encounter guys that have, you know, done 10 deployments or 15 deployments, those numbers are going to go up drastically. So every SWIC operator is going to be a little different. But essentially what we're talking about is uh, micro concussions. The average SWIC operator logs 3,000 hours of boat time in one deployment cycle. As we talk later in this presentation, I'll tell you how I get there. But it's not just a random number I came up with. And I did collaborate uh, with other individuals on that number. Uh, based on a Roche uh, 1994 study, hope I said his name correctly, uh, which I believe to be a seminal study uh, regarding uh, what we're talking about, SWIC endure roughly 124 significant G-force impacts per hour, potentially causing MTBI. Uh, the average SWIC operator could potentially endure over 300,000 significant wave impacts per deployment cycle. So a ton of uh, TBI exposure. There's no occupation in the world that I'm aware of with this type of TBI exposure. And there has been some recent uh, significant research done uh, regarding traumatic brain injury and SWIC operators. Uh, Dr. Pearl, Daniel Pearl uh, of the uh, Brain Repository in Bethesda here in 2022, uh, published an abstract on some research they did. One of our guys uh, committed suicide last year, 2021, and they were able to get his brain tissue and do an aut autopsy, and the autopsy revealed uh, CTE. Now, the conclusion that they came to was this was due to SWIC fast boat operations, way pounding, whiplash, all of those things that we're going to be talking about in uh, this presentation. And finally, what we're here to talk about, uh, operator syndrome. It's a condition that all special operations uh, forces uh, suffer from. I'm here to talk about the nexus of operator syndrome uh, symptoms for special warfare boat operators. Uh, operator syndrome was termed by Dr. Christopher Frew. Hope I said his name correctly. And there is a DOI link there uh, giving you the address to this uh, literature if you need to find it on the internet and uh, take a look at it. Operator syndrome is a nexus of psychiatric illnesses and disorders along with chronic major orthopedic injuries. Operator syndrome affects a soft or special operations forces from all major branches. And the literature describes these uh, different units as Army Green Berets, Rangers, Delta, Special Mission Units, uh, Navy SEALs, Navy SWIC, 
uh, MARSOC, Force Recon, Special Operations Squadrons, Combat Controllers, Pararescue or PJs, Explosive Ordnance and Demolition Personnel serving across uh, multiple branches. The next two slides are going to cover the symptoms of Operator Syndrome. We have Traumatic Brain Injury or TBI, Endocrine Dysfunction, Sleep Disturbance, obstruct Obstructive sleep apnea, chronic joint, back pain, orthopedic problems and headaches, substance abuse, depression and suicide, post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD, and anger. Worry, rumination, and stress reactivity, marital, family, and community dysfunction, Problems with sexual health and intimacy, being on guard or hyper vigilant, memory, concentration, and cognitive impairments, vestibular and vision impairments, and challenges of the transition from military to civilian life, and a couple other issues there as well. So how does operator syndrome occur? Well, I'm going to talk about this uh, as I read these slides. I'm going to kind of go through it and also talk about it from my own personal experience. Uh, special operators endure extremely difficult training that challenges mental toughness, aptitude, psychological and physical fitness levels. Uh, yeah, every every school, it doesn't matter which one we're talking about here. They're all difficult. Uh, they're all uh, physically challenging and mentally challenging as well. <clears throat> there's a ton of stress and there's a lot of sleep deprivation. So it doesn't matter which program we're talking about here. All, all the soft forces go through difficult training. When you get to a team, uh, you get out there and you start traveling, you start training, and it's just a continuous cycle. You're always out there, you're always moving, you're training and you're traveling. The op tempo is extremely high and you just don't, you know, sit down and, and do nothing and you don't get a lot of sleep. You're always gone. Special operators work during the night and have disturbed sleep patterns. Yep, check in the box. Uh, this causes insomnia, check in the box. According to Fru and others in 2020, operators uh, face a number of concerns that put them at risk for problems with sleep, including TBI, check in the box, headaches, check in the box, pain, check in the box, endocrine system, yep, uh, psychiatric illnesses, check in the box, being on guard or hypervigilant, yes, alcohol abuse, check in the box, and all which negatively affect circadian rhythms. So we work at night, we train at night, we do missions at night, and all of those uh, circadian rhythms, that night and day rhythms where we sleep and, and work and things, they're all disrupted. They're all disrupted. So that causes a cascade of symptoms and injuries and effects, all of these things that we're talking about here. Special operators do extremely dangerous jobs that may cause serious injury or death in training or on missions. Many special operators endure emotional stress from uh, loss of teammates. All of us have endured the death of a teammate. We've been to funerals and, and this is a difficult emotional thing uh, to deal with. The first thing I want to talk about with operator syndrome symptoms is traumatic uh, brain injury and uh, traumatic brain injury defined. So there's uh, a lot of different definitions on the internet, the literature, uh, it goes back a couple of decades. And this was, uh, this definition here came from the 90s. There's uh, more, there's newer, more relevant things, but this is what I came up with. Uh, traumatic, uh, traumatic brain injury, uh, traumatically, it is traumatically induced structural injury and or physiological disruption of brain function as a result of external force that is indicated by new onset or worsening of one or more of the following loss of or decreased consciousness check in that box there 
loss of memory uh, immediately before or after injury check in the box alteration of mental state at the time of injury uh, IE or EG confusion disorientation and slow thinking absolutely checking in in the box there uh, neurological deficits examples are weakness balance disturbance praxis which is motor planning inability to plan movement checking the box and all of these things uh, paresis uh, muscular which is mus muscular weakness caused by nerve damage or disease uh, check that box a bunch of times Change in vision, check that box. Other sensory alterations, yes. Aphasia, which is language disorder, which affects ability to communicate. You could probably check that box just by listening to this presentation. And uh, permanent transient, hmm, not sure about that one. And then there's uh, in intracranial lesion, and definitely check that box as well. So now that we've defined TBI, let's talk about TBI causation. A couple of different things here to look at. Uh, number one, the head being struck. Pretty obvious. Number two, the head striking an object. Yep, got it. Number three, this is number three is the one that we're going to focus on regarding SWIC operators because this is the one that pertains to us. The brain undergoing an acceleration and deceleration movement i.e. whiplash without direct external trauma to the head so picture this you're on a boat you're doing 65 miles an hour you're in three four five six foot seas the boat is jumping out of the water it's pounding into the next wave the boat is kind of stopping a little for a microsecond the brain, the body, and everything else is moving and bouncing. The brain is bouncing around inside the skull. And you do this over and over and over and over and over for 10, 15 hours at a time. And that's basically what it's like being on a swig fast boat. So, the literature here uh, shows that swig operators utilize small boats at high velocities experiencing repeated whiplash uh, whiplash like shock forces as boats traverse and impact waves this is taken uh, verbatim from uh, dr pearl and uh, dr premier this causes high rates of musculoskeletal injuries and neuropsychiatric complaints yep check all those boxes and uh, Dr. Pearl and Premier 2022 conclude that unique exposure from a SWIC career provides uh, sufficient TBI for CTE development. So this is the latest thing out there on the press. And like I think I said earlier, uh, one of our guys committed suicide in 2021. These guys uh, got the brain matter and did autopsies on it. And... Uh, were able to conclude that this individual had CTE and it was related to SWIC boats, wave pounding, whiplash, and all of those effects. So this in fact is something that proves SWIC operators get traumatic brain injury from riding boats, pounding waves, and going through this process over and over and over and over and over. As we talk about SWIG TBI causation, I just wanted to present a few other literatures to draw information from. And if you have the time to go out and do research, there's a, there's a ton of uh, research out there. There's a ton of literature. I just pulled out a few just kind of to make the point. Uh, Paris Pahansen, hope I said that right and others back in 2020 concluded through a two-year research project that high-speed boat operators suffer daily occurrences of tiredness check that box concentration difficulties check that box uh, decision making complications check that box and memory recalling issues uh, check that box i don't know how many times a day it's ridiculous indicating significant performance deg degradation due due to vibration exposure from high-speed boat operations. 
uh, paragraph pretty much explains itself. And then Zieg, Hemat, and others, <laughs> 2013, determined high-speed boat operations cause mental disorders and uh, muscul musculoskeletal disorders that significantly degrade quality of life among speedboat operators. Yep. It is also noted that mental health and musculoskeletal disorders, or MSDs, continue to degenerate with age. Uh, definitely have noticed that over the last 10 years. Uh, they also conclude that MSDs are the second largest occupational health issue in the world, according to the World Health Organization, and MSDs are defined as injuries to the muscle, nerves, tendons, ligament, ligaments, joints, cartilage, and spinal disc. Uh, check all those boxes. Been dealing with those things in just about every extremity for quite a long time. So next up is TBI symptomology. It should be recognized that patients with mild traumatic brain injury can exhibit persistence, emotional, cognitive, behavioral, and physical symptoms alone or, in, alone or in combination, which may produce a functional disability. Check all those blocks, uh, blocks a few times. Uh, physical symptoms of brain injury, uh, examples are nausea, check that box. Vomiting, not so much. Uh, dizziness, check. Headache, check. Blurred vision, check. Sleep disturbance, yep, check. Uh, quickness to fatigue, oh my god, yes, check. Lethargy, check. And other sensory loss, uh, check. <clears throat> that cannot be accounted for by peripheral injury or other causes. So that's physical symptoms. Cognitive deficits are involving attention, check. Concentration, check. Perception, check. Memory, check. Speech and language, check. Executive functions, uh, check. That cannot be completely accounted for by emotional state or other causes. And then lastly, we have behavioral changes and or alterations in degree of emotional responsi responsivity. Uh, examples are irritability, check that off. Oh my God. Uh, quickness to anger, yes. Uh, disinhibition, check. Emotional liabil liability, check. That cannot be accounted for by a psychological reaction or to physical or emotional stress or other causes. Okay, and the last thing about TBI is uh, TBI long-term effects. Now, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is the long-term effects, and I'm 56 years old. I've been retired since 2010. My peer group, all the guys, SWIC operators that I work with are 55 and 60 years old. Every one of them are living in TBI long-term effects. They have all these issues. I know I have all these issues and I'm going to kind of quickly cover them. And the problem is most of us don't have any diagnosis from the VA. We don't have any help from the VA. We don't have any help from SOCOM, from NSW, from any in any of the entities out there, but yet they they put us out there for many years operating, put us through all this, destroyed us, and here we are. So TBI long-term effects. You got memory loss, check that. Headaches, check. Seizures, dizziness, vertigo, visual changes, fatigue, paralysis, balance problems, reduced language skills, all the above. Anxiety, pretty bad. Depression, pretty bad. Uh, difficulty concentrating, yes. Uh, heartbeat irregularities, uh, it's it's up and down, man. It's one minute that's 200, the next minute it's 40. <clears throat> Changes in blood pressure, definitely blood pressure has gone up. I'm on blood pressure medicine. Uh, sensitivity to light and noise, absolutely. Short-term memory problems, yeah, that's a big one there. For me, executive function dysfunction, 100%. Sleep disturbances, I've had that for a long time. Insomnia, sleep apnea, pretty bad at this point. 
Uh, irritability, absolutely. Changes of loss in taste and smell. This is something that I've noticed over the last couple of years. I'm not sure if it's related to COVID or if it's uh, related to traumatic brain injury, but I've definitely noticed noticed uh, this over the last two years. Uh, confusion, yes, personality changes, pretty dramatic for me over the last 20 years. Uh, tinnitus, hearing changes, absolutely. Tinnitus is uh, constant ringing. It goes from one ear to the other, and it's and I get it every day. Mood swings, kind of up, kind of down, kind of like a bipolar or something, you would think. Uh, yeah, all the time. The next symptom of operator syndrome uh, to discuss is the endocrine system dysfunction. Uh, inside the brain, you have the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. Uh, they're pretty small areas of the brain. They're probably right at the center of the brain. And the hypothalamus is uh, the control center for your endocrine system and your uh, automatic uh, nervous system. So when you have injuries in these areas of the brain, you have hormone dysfunction and it causes a wide variety of different things. Hypothyroidism uh, means that you don't have enough uh, thyroid hormone. You, you end up with fatigue, constipation, weight gain, cold intolerance. So I've experienced a lot of this. I'm not sure if it's uh, related to hypothyroidism or not, but I do know that I have a lot of those, uh, those issues. Uh, hypogonadism is not enough sex hormones and you end up with uh, erectile dysfunction, breast enlargement, loss of uh, body hair and muscle mass. <clears throat> uh, growth hormone deficiency, uh, you end up with increased fat, loss of muscle and bone and decreased energy. And I know my growth hormone levels are down along with my T level and uh, I definitely have these uh, symptoms. And then hyperprolactinemia is too much prolactin and you end up with erectile dysfunction or ED. I seem to be experiencing a little bit of this. So I'm not sure if it's uh, related to this issue or not. And a few more things about the uh, endocrine system uh, to talk about is the pituitary, uh, <laughs> oh my God, pituitary gland. Uh, this is a small gland at the base of your brain, as I talked about in the last slide. It releases hormones affecting the functions of many other glands in your body. The thyroid gland, uh, this gland is in your neck and helps regulate metabolism and growth. A lot of SWIC uh, operators uh, in my peer group seem to be uh, overweight, and I think this is one of the things that uh, might be uh, part of the cause. Uh, parathyroid glands. These glands are located behind the thyroid gland and they release hormones that regulate the level of calcium in, in your blood. And I definitely have a pro problem with the level of calcium in my blood. <clears throat> I'm on medication for that. Uh, adrenal glands. Uh, these glands control many bodily functions including blood pressure and heart rate and they are located near your kidneys. And this is part of the uh, ANS, uh, sympathetic uh, autonom autonomic nervous system. And I've definitely got some malfunctions with this uh, with this part of the endocrine system. Uh, pineal gland, uh, this gland produces uh, melatonin, which helps regulate your sleep cycle, circadian rhythms. And uh, I've had issues with sleep and insomnia for a long time. So definitely uh, something connected to this. Uh, hypothalamus, as I mentioned earlier, this part of the brain regulates hunger, uh, thirst, body temperature. It also secretes hormones that signal the pituitary gland to release hormones and controls the auto autonomic nervous system. And I have a lot of different issues with my, my, my ANS, so uh, definitely something to uh, consider. Uh, Entry. Uh, pancreas, <clears throat> this organ helps regulate digestion and produces insulin, which helps regulate uh, blood sugar levels. 
Uh, thymus, this gland makes hormones involved in producing white blood cells, which help fight uh, infections in the body. And I've got an issue with my white blood cells. Uh, testes, these glands produce sperm and testosterone. My, my T levels are pretty low, and ovaries don't really apply to me. Okay, the next symptom uh, within operator syndrome to talk about is uh, sleep disturbances and uh, circadian rhythms. Uh, we have physiological and endocrine system or circadian cycles. Uh, when these uh, uh, cycles are interrupted, it causes a lot of different problems in the body. Uh, some of these problems are sleep disturbances, uh, uh, which inter uh, interrupt the proper cycles and changes uh, body temperature over time, uh, blood pressure, urine volume, uh, cerebral blood flow, uh, melatonin levels, uh, cortisol levels, and when these things are supposed to be released and uh, they're not released at the proper times, uh, growth hormone deficiencies, thyroid issues, and uh, metabolism problems. So all of these things here are a result of uh, interruptions in the, the circadian cycles. So <clears throat> long-term disruption of circadian cycles is linked to cancer, cardiovascular disease, and mental disorders. According to some research done by NYPD over a 50-year span, and, and what they were looking at was uh, the differences uh, with people with, who were working night shift versus day shift and how uh, working the night shift uh, interrupted circadian cycles and uh, caused all of these medical problems. So how does that affect SWIC operators? Well, uh, we work at night and we work long hours, we're sleep deprived, and over time we, we end up with these issues. I, I remember as an operator, working all these hours working at night all the time and i don't remember it bothering me so much you know looking at all these symptoms here but i do know now you know i'm 55 years old 56 years old you know 20 years uh, after the fact and these these things are all major issues so i think when you look at this you have to look at the long-term uh, consequences of interrupting your circadian cycles and uh, I ended up getting insomnia probably during SWIC school. And then while I was an operator, just being up all the time, I've always had difficulties uh, falling asleep. Sleep apnea, uh, it started for me probably around 2007, 2008. Uh, I noticed a lot of issues in my sleep and snoring. And my wife said I didn't. Sometimes I would start uh, stop breathing, so I, I got a sleep uh, study done in 2008, I believe, while active duty, and it didn't indicated that I had sleep apnea, but it just wasn't at a high enough level to rate a CPAP machine. So <clears throat> back then I was probably 200 pounds, 195, 200 pounds, and and I was already having these issues. Now, you fast forward to here, 2022, I'm 56 years old, I'm 30 pounds heavier, I have all these orthopedic injuries, can't work out uh, the way that I used to, I gained all this weight, and now my sleep apnea is uh, is a lot worse and I have to use a CPAP machine. So this this story that I'm saying is, is pretty typical of every SWIC operator. Um, <clears throat> All right, another common problem uh, within the realm of operator syndrome that is uh, prominent within SWIC operators is chronic joint, back uh, pain, orthopedic problems, and headaches. So this is head to toe. Uh, I have uh, personally, I have uh, cervical stenosis. Uh, it leads to numbness in my arms, my hands. I have a uh, formal uh, stenosis in my C4 region, C5 and C6. Uh, C5, I have roughly about nine millimeters uh, in circumference around the spine. So it's uh, pretty close to requiring surgery. 
Uh, thoracic, uh, thoracic fractures, I have uh, uh, T4, 50% uh, height loss, T5, 50% height loss, and T8, same thing. Um, <clears throat> I have uh, lumbar pain. Uh, pretty significant pain, shooting pain that goes into my thoracic and my leg area. Uh, a lot of issues with the uh, spine. I have seven bulging discs and, uh, throughout the C, uh, C spine, T spine, and the L spine. Uh, three shoulder surgeries, uh, two on the left side, one on the right side. Got some hard, hardware in the right shoulder. Uh, two right knee surgeries. Uh, Carpal and cubital surgery, both elbows and wrists, both arms, uh, both hips need replacement. Probably not going to ever do that, but it's, it's uh, something that needs uh, attention. Uh, right knee, my right knee needs a partial replacement. Uh, just got my second uh, knee surgery and uh, the doctor told me I needed to get it a partial replacement. Uh, probably in the next 10 years because uh, I didn't want to do it now. Uh, chronic joint pain in all my joints, absolutely. Um, I was diagnosed with osteopenia, uh, which is like the precursor to osteoporosis. So kind of dealing with arthritis in every, every joint in the body, a lot of pain, stiffness, difficulty moving around when I get up, when, when I'm going to bed. Uh, headaches and migraines, yeah, this is something that's uh, it's pretty continual. I don't think there's any time where I really don't ever have a headache. It's just a constant thing. I get migraines frequently. I do take medications for that as well. And uh, <clears throat> the uh, T4 joint pain, I would say, is constantly around a 9 on the pain scale. So when you look at the chronic pain, uh, joint pain, orthopedic, orthopedic problems, all of these things came from riding on boats. Fast boats, wave pounding, uh, uh, vibrations, significant G-forces. I know there's a lot of studies out there that have shown uh, 25 Gs up to 100 Gs. And I know uh, Special Warfare Group 4 has a lot of data on this. But I've talked to hundreds of SWIC operators who are retired in their 50s and their 60s, my age, my peer group. And all of these guys have a, a long list of injuries, just like I do. Some of these guys have lost the use of their legs and can't walk anymore. And some of these guys are close to not being able to walk again. And they're only in their 50s. So this is a significant issue for SWIC operators. The next symptom among uh, SWIC operators and operator syndrome is substance abuse and PTSD. Substance abuse is prevalent with many SWIC operators. Uh, I personally have had my share of beer on a consistent basis. Uh, we work in small groups, we train together, we deploy together, uh, we go out, we party, and we do all of those things and it just becomes kind of a lifestyle of uh, drinking and partying. And there's definitely a lot of substance abuse in, in that regard. And, you know, long-term effects of that, there's a lot of that out there on how alcohol affects all the systems in the body and the brain. So it's, it's definitely a contributing factor uh, to operator syndrome for SWIC operators. Uh, PTSD, it's not something that you really think about riding on boats. Uh, you, you think about PTSD. Uh, it's commonly connected to traumatic events, which uh, the research literature and medical community covers this topic extremely well. Uh, what is not known uh, very well is that MTBI or repetitive brain trauma that SWICs endure from weight pounding and whiplash causes PTSD symptoms over long term and subsequent PSD, uh, PTSD diagnosis. So many years you're riding boats, you're pounding these waves, uh, you're getting whiplash, you're exposed to significant g-force and vibration constantly and you end up with traumatic brain injury and traumatic brain injury is something that leads to uh, PTSD so something that we have to deal with. Alright next uh, we want to talk about anxiety and depression. 
their symptoms of operator uh, syndrome and they're prevalent among SWIC operators. Uh, mild traumatic brain injury, MTBI, or concussion is the most common type of traumatic brain injury. With MTBI comes uh, symptoms that include headaches, fatigue, depression, anxiety, irritability, as well as uh, impaired cognitive function. SWIC operators suffer from long-term MTBI effects categorized as post-concussion uh, syndrome. Anxiety and depression can become debilitating long-term issues. Uh, most of my life, I uh, really didn't know anything about these two things. I uh, never thought that there would be something that I would have to deal with. But in 2008, I was diagnosed with depression. And that's I was on active duty at the time. And it was kind of attributed to, uh, at that time, with me getting out of the military. So, unfortunately for me, you know, my, my time on the boats was 1996 all the way up to around 2004. And in that time frame, uh, I had a seizure in 2004, and that's when I, I got kind of taken out of the fight, if you will. Couldn't, uh, couldn't do my job as a SWIC operator after 2004 because of, of having a seizure. And uh, <clears throat> I wasn't properly diagnosed when it comes to depression while I was active duty uh, and it wasn't connected to MTBI or traumatic brain injury because I was uh, never aware of traumatic brain injury when I was an operator. Uh, we didn't know anything about it. The SWIC community wasn't talking about it. Uh, no one was. And uh, we weren't being diagnosed with it. We weren't being treated for it. We weren't complaining about it. So my entire time in the military, I never talked about traumatic brain injury. Never went to medical. Never saw anyone. Didn't get diagnosed with it. But here I was, active duty. I'm having seizures. I'm having depression. And now I'm developing anxiety. And all of these things are kind of all interconnected. And it's just something that now, at you know, 56 years old, uh, many years after, you know, post-trauma, and these things are significant issues that I have to deal with every single day. And with talking with guys who are retired from the community, just about every guy that I've talked to is dealing with one of these or the other or actually both of them. So it's, it's prevalent in the community. All right, the next symptoms in operator syndrome to talk about are memory concentration and cognitive impairments. Uh, I went to Tulane's uh, three-day assessment for traumatic brain injury back in 2021. Uh, they said I had uh, central auditory processing disorder, so <clears throat> some problems with uh, hearing and uh, processing information. Um, there's also a thing called mild to moderate neurocognitive disorder and the other and this is within TBI and the other uh, disorder would be delirium. <clears throat> uh, Tulane said I had moderate uh, neurocognitive disorder and uh, it's uh, affecting my executive functioning. The symptoms are confusion, difficulty remembering or focusing, personality changes, vision problems, Anxiety, depression, agitation, insomnia, apathy, trouble with routine daily activities. So all of these things are, are uh, issues that I have to deal with. <coughs> uh, causes of neurocognitive disorder can be diseases such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson, Huntington, dementia, MS, uh, and TBI. All right, vestibular and vision impairments is something within operator syndrome. And us SWIC guys uh, seem to get it. Uh, there's central ocular motor dysfunction. This is something uh, Tulane told me that I have. And uh, the, it's the brain's ability to coordinate the eyes to move with accuracy and control. So definitely got an issue with that. And then vestib uh, vestibular uh, system dysfunction is disturbance in the body's balance system. Uh, due to an <clears throat> insult in the vestibular system of the inner ear or the central nervous system, processing centers, or both. 
So definitely have some issues there. And uh, most guys that I've talked with seem to have the same problem. All right, now that we've talked about uh, all the different symptoms of operator syndrome and how they apply to SWIC operators, we're going to talk about traumatic brain injury uh, among SWIC operators. Now, every SWIC operator at some point in time has traumatic brain injury, 100% across the board. If you want to challenge that, challenge it, but you're going to find it. Uh, <clears throat> so, the average SWIC operator logs about 3,000 hours of boat time per deployment cycle. Now, I came up with this number and I cross-referenced uh, or collaborated with some retired senior chiefs who were former ops guys and uh, also Naval Special Warfare Group 4 who, who keeps all the data on this. And we all came up to pretty much the same conclusion. 3,000 hours of boat time per deployment cycle, just averaging things out. So a Roche study in 1994 uh, what they did is they ran the boats, a couple of eight sacks, I think, for about 36 hours. And in that 36 hour time, time frame, they recorded over 8,000 uh, G force impacts. And, and the range is all the way up from uh, 1 to 25 Gs. <clears throat> now, over 4,000 of these uh, impacts that they measured were between 5 and 15 Gs which is a range that is significant enough to, to definitely cause whiplash and traumatic brain injury. And what this equaled out to is over 300 impacts per hour, and you're looking at 124 impacts per hour that possibly cause tra mild traumatic brain injury. <clears throat> so if you look at those numbers and you apply it to 3,000 hours of boat time for the average book operator, you end up coming up with over well over 300,000 uh, impacts that the average SWIC operator endures in one deployment cycle. So if you're looking at over 300,000 significant G-force impacts in one deployment cycle, the guy that comes in and does one deployment in four years and gets out has pretty significant exposure to, to uh, traumatic brain injury. Now you take these numbers and you multiply them by 5, 10, or 15 deployments for some guys that did a long time in SWIC and you're looking at some very severe, significant uh, traumatic brain injury exposure. Uh, SWIC operators, uh, we get TBI from other mechanisms, not, not just the boats, but my focus is on the boats in this presentation, but uh, we do have head impacts. We're exposed to shock and the vibration from the boats. We shoot a lot of heavy weapons. So a lot of uh, machine gun fire causes traumatic brain injury as well as uh, parachuting incidences. So there's a lot of different ways that uh, SWIC, get, uh, SWIC operators get traumatic brain injury. Um, but this uh, presentation is focused on the boats and wave bondage. Now that we've talked about operator syndrome, we've talked about symptoms and how all these, all these things are interconnected with SWIC operators. Uh, what I want to do in this next segment of the presentation is just talk about an etiological uh, look at operator syndrome uh, just for my own, the, all my own symptoms. When, you know, looking at a linear timeline going back to 96 when I was in SWIC school, all the way up to present day, which is uh, 2022. I think the uh, ideological approach for each individual operator is a way that we can connect all of these things together and show uh, being on boats and uh, fast boat weight pounding as causation for traumatic brain injury. But uh, until we're able to look at each individual from an ideological uh, perspective, uh, we're going to have a hard time showing uh, traumatic brain injury among SWIC operators who are retired. <clears throat> so, in 96, I went to SWIC school. I graduated. I was in class 20. Uh, 97, I reported to uh, Boat Team 12. Back then, it was uh, SBU 12. Uh, February 97, I went to SEER school. 
we all know what happens to Sears school. You're sleep deprived. You're out in the woods for a week. Eventually, they throw you throw you in a prison camp and kind of do some torture on you and slam you around and, and all of those things. Um, and then for 96 to 97, I worked on some ribs, uh, 10 meter ribs. And then about mid 97, I was assigned to a Mark V detachment. So from there, I started working long nights, not getting a lot of sleep, and developed uh, insomnia. Uh, started getting into a lot of alcohol abuse. And uh, by the end of 97, I was five or six months into working on these uh, Mark Vives, and I was already having severe neck pain. Uh, my pain was so bad, I couldn't rotate my neck. It was to the point where I had to go to a chiropractor. I'd never been to a chiropractor before, but at that point, that was the only way I could get any kind of relief in my neck at all. So from 1997 to 2003, I accumulated over 10,000 hours of uh, boat time on the Mark Fives, operating at speeds of 65 miles an hour uh, for the majority of the time. And, and the reason I say that is uh, in 97, these boats were brand new. Uh, they were brand new to us. They were brand new to the community. And uh, we, were, we were driving these boats everywhere we went, top speed, didn't really matter. That's all we knew how to do. So it was just full speed all the time. Heavy seas didn't matter. And the uh, weight pounding was pretty significant. So over that time frame, you know, I accumulated far greater than 250,000 uh, G-force impacts uh, that cause whiplash and traumatic brain injury. So I would say if you're looking at 300,000 uh, per cycle, there was well over a million impacts, probably more than that, uh, that I uh, endured on these boats. But I'd say, you know, at least 250,000 or greater were impacts that could cause traumatic brain injury. Uh, I, w I had insomnia in that time. I was working uh, at night all the time, doing training, doing missions overseas, deployed, everything. I did uh, training missions that were 52 hours long, so you imagine a couple of days of not getting any sleep. Um, I remember urinating blood after uh, different ops, being mentally and physically fatigued all the time. I did multiple six-month deployments to the Middle East, uh, several different exercises, six-week exercises overseas, and uh, it was just constantly gone constantly uh, getting weight pounding and, and just accumulating all of this stuff. So 2003 and 2004, I did a quick two year stint in training department at the boat team. And then right as I was getting, uh, getting ready to transition back to sea duty and start deploying again, I ended up having a ground mall seizure. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so, 2004, grandma seizure. Prior to that, I had had uh, 10,000 hours on boats, exposure to 250,000 plus uh, MTBI events on fast boats. So these these things are absolutely interconnected. Uh, seizures are definitely symptoms of traumatic brain injury and some of the things that happen long term. Um, 2004, in 2004, I started having out-of-body experiences, feelings of impending doom, problems with my memory, focus, concentration. I started having feelings of anxiety, depression, and personality changes. All of these things were happening in this time frame. I uh, started having neck uh, headaches, uh, back pain, neck pain, joint pain. So within six to eight years as a SWIG operator, all of these things were pretty prevalent. So I had a lot of a lot of things that are connected to traumatic brain injury. At the time, uh, 2004, uh, SWIG didn't know anything about traumatic brain injury. We weren't talking about it. We weren't being treated for it. We weren't going to medical for it. There was no diagnosis. So uh, any symptoms that I had were not connected to traumatic brain injury because it's something that we didn't know about. So continuing on, in 2004, I had bilateral hip pain, uh, knee pain in my right knee. Uh, 2004, I had a right uh, shoulder dislocation, 
Uh, Zars also having uh, thoracic spine issues. Uh, started having headaches, uh, back pain, neck pain, joint pain. In 2005, I had uh, left shoulder tears. Uh, 2007, had a left shoulder surgery. Uh, 2008, I was diagnosed with cervical stenosis. In 2008, uh, also had a sleep study for insomnia, sleep disturbances, and mild sleep apnea. So some of these things, or all of these things are connected to the boats. Uh, all of these things are connected to uh, wave pounding and g-forces and then a lot of these things are interconnected with traumatic brain injury uh, by 2008 i began having heart palpitations which limited my ability to run it seemed like i would uh, i would go on a run and about five to ten minutes into the run i'd have these just real heavy heart uh, heartbeats, uh, palpitations that scared the shit out of me, so I would stop running. Uh, 2009, I had shoulder surgery on my right shoulder and uh, got some hardware put in it. In 2009, I was, I was told that I needed both hips, uh, uh, surgery in both my hips, but I refused that treatment because I had just gone through three, three uh, major joint surgeries in about a year and a half time frame. Uh, 2008 to 2009, I had a diagnosis for uh, major depression, anxiety, issues with irritability, memory, focus, concentration, sleep, migraines, and headaches. And uh, 2010, I retired from the military. At the time, I was about 204 pounds. <clears throat> when I uh, when I was diagnosed with the uh, depression and anxiety, it was it was misdiagnosed because, like I said. Uh, when I was active duty, we didn't know about TBI. SWIC wasn't doing anything about TBI. We weren't talking about it. We weren't being treated for it. And uh, <clears throat> there was, didn't know anything about it, so I couldn't make the connection between depression, anxiety, irritability, all these, all these uh, symptoms that I had, and uh, TBI. Uh, hindsight, it's pretty clear. It's easy to see. And uh, that's the whole purpose of the etiological uh, perspective. In 2015, <clears throat> I really started noticing uh, a lot of MTBI symptoms uh, and that they were getting uh, pretty significant. Uh, in 2015, I started uh, asking a lot of questions uh, with other SWIC guys, and that's when I really started learning about MTBI and whiplash due to SWIC boat weight pounding. <clears throat> so I, learned, I got a lot, a lot of TBI awareness and uh, I learned that uh, the military and SOCOM and Spec War and, uh, and all these entities had instituted some protocols for TBI for for everyone in SOCOM or under the SOCOM umbrella. And that's when I uh, first started realizing that uh, SWIC was uh, looking at TBI and treating uh, individuals. In 2015, I was having speech issues. I was having memory problems, focus problems, concentration, irritability, and uh, a lot of mind blanking, just sitting there not thinking about anything. Uh, <clears throat> from 2017 to current, I got headaches, migraines, and, and these things just seems to be, uh, seem to be getting worse. In 2019, I went to the uh, TBI clinic at the uh, Biloxi VA, and uh, they diagnosed me with TBI and mild uh, neurocognitive uh, disorder. Um, unfortunately, the, uh, the neurologist there didn't seem to think that SWIC uh, fast boat operations was a causation for tra uh, traumatic brain injury. <clears throat> they they kind of just laughed it off. Uh, in 2019, I filed a VA claim for TBI. Of course, I was denied. In 2019, uh, I was seen for migraines, headaches, post-concussion syndrome, and I uh, really started seeking a lot of uh, uh, care for all of these issues around that time frame. In 2021, I went to the Tulane Center for Brain Health uh, for their three-day TBI assessment. Um, <clears throat> They diagnosed me with traumatic brain injury, uh, PTSD, major depression, anxiety, moderate neurocognitive disorder, central processing disorder, uh, migraines, headaches, and uh, a host of uh, orthopedic injuries. 
So Tulane uh, did a three days of, of intensive uh, work, uh, very, very good. Uh, probably one of the best uh, experiences that I've ever had. In 2021, I filed for higher level review for my TBI and, and uh, was once again denied service connection. Uh, it's kind of funny because I went I went to some of the uh, some of the doctors' visits for the the TBI claim and one of the doctors in particular, you know, I had this mountain of evidence, buddy statements, all kinds of things. I had a letter from uh, Special Warfare Group Four for. Uh, um, Occupational letter saying that SWIC, you know, we and we get TV offering the those those types of things. And uh, this one doctor said, "Man, it's just, it's just." He didn't even want to talk to me and sit down and, and do the normal procedures because he said it was so obvious to him that I had traumatic brain injury and that it was service connected that he wasn't going to waste his time doing all that. <clears throat> and these, uh, <laughs> I just think it's funny that they still denied me anyway. In uh, 2021, uh, did a sleep study which revealed significant sleep apnea changes and uh, ended up getting on a CPAP machine. 2022, had significant changes in cognitive function, memory, speech, anxiety, panic attacks, inability to regulate temperature, heart rate, the auto autonomic uh, nervous system, and a lot of endocrine uh, system dysfunction. So <clears throat> that's this year, a lot of changes, uh, negative changes kind of taking place this year. Uh, 2022 was onset of high blood pressure requiring medication, so now I'm on blood pressure medicine. And from 2010 to 2022, I realized that I lost an uh, inch and a half on my height uh, due to vertebrae deterioration. So <clears throat> if you kind of look back from 1996 all the way up to 2022, and you take all these things in perspective, you can see that they're all interconnected to fast boats, wave pounding, mild traumatic brain injury, and major uh, orthopedic injury. Okay, finally, just to, to summarize uh, this whole etiological approach, uh, it's easy to look in a linear fashion and see the connection between SWIC uh, fast boat service, MTBI, and a cascade of operator syndrome symptoms. It's all there. It started in 96. It's 2022 now. And these things are just compounded each other year after year after year. And uh, this ideological approach holds true for every SWIC operator in my peer group. There, are, I could give you a list of a thousand guys and uh, you could interview every one of them kind of in the same way that I'm doing this approach. And you would see uh the same thing with every one of them so, you know some of them are uh, far worse off than i am some of them aren't quite as bad as i am everybody has a, a different uh uh number of years of exposure and different things but every every guy that i know in my age group in my peer group has the same problems we're all suffering from long-term uh, uh effects of traumatic brain injury and uh, major orthopedic injury so our quality of life has been changed drastically. We are living in uh, the long-term effects of TBI and orthopedic injury and the uh, DOD uh, Warrior Brain Health uh, program. Uh, one of their pillars is uh, to, to help individuals a to study the long-term effects and and to help uh, treat long-term effects of TBI. Retired SWIC operators in my peer group are the perfect group of individuals that the DoD needs to look at in terms of studying because there's a gap. No one's looked at this group of, of individuals. There's definitely a gap in the research, but we are the ones that are living in significant injury. Uh, associated with traumatic brain injury and uh, long-term orthopedic uh, problems and uh, we don't have diagnosis we don't have treatment we every one of us has been the majority of us have been uh, denied by the VA and uh, we need help from somebody all right the last thing I want to talk about are the objectives of this presentation 
I want to make it very clear that these things are what I'm setting out to accomplish. Uh, we need to help DOD, SOCOM, NSW, the VA, uh, research groups, uh, all these entities understand that there's a research gap that exists. There are thousands of retired SWIC operators ages 50 and up who are suffering from long-term effects of MTBI and major orthopedic injury. There are thousands of retired and former SWIC operators who have TBI and no diagnosis, no rating from the VA. Many have been denied ratings, uh, that's including myself. There are thousands of SWIC operators who need long-term care for TBI and don't have uh, long-term care. So these things need to be addressed and uh, there's some changes that have to be made. Uh, congressional law needs to establish SWIC, uh, traumatic brain injury and major orthopedic injury as presumptive for all SWIC operators with the VA. This has to get done. Like I said, there, there are a thousand guys, two thousand guys, I don't know, there's a lot. Uh, they all have traumatic brain injury. They have no diagnosis and no ratings, none of these things from the VA. And they're just dealing with these things on their own. It has to be presumptive so we don't have to fight the VA to get any kind of rating, get any kind of help uh, with traumatic brain injury because every one of us has traumatic brain injury. you got to understand that. Congressional law needs to establish operator syndrome and associated symptoms. And this is probably a big one. Maybe this is what SOCOM can do. I don't know. Uh, congressional law needs to establish uh, operator syndrome and associated symptoms as presumptive with the VA for all soft units from every branch of service. I mean, this has got to be the big end goal here. Uh, every every operator, male and female, that spends time uh, in these special operations units across all the branches, they end up with operator syndrome, this whole nexus of uh, issues with uh, traumatic brain injury and major orthopedic injuries. Uh, we shouldn't have to fight the VA to get coverage and rating. We shouldn't have to fight the VA to get any kind of help. Uh, it should be just handed to us. It should be presumptive. There needs to be congressional law to make this happen. So that's the whole objective. I mean, that's like the top tier objective right here. It's, it's for all the special operations forces. So uh, thank you for your time and uh, God bless. Uh, just one uh, last uh, slide for some final comments. Um, if you're a retired SWIC operator or active duty SWIC operator, um, the brain repository in Bethesda, uh, they're looking for donors. So there aren't a lot of SWIC uh, brains that they've looked at, but uh, what they have seen so far had CT in it. So uh, CTE in it, so they they need they need us to be volunteers and donate our brains. I've done it. I've talked to other guys, and uh, they've done it as well. So if you go to researchbraininjury.com, you can get on there and uh, you can go through the process. It's pretty easy to do. So I encourage guys uh, to please uh, think about donating your brain. Uh, the Tulane Center for Brain Health, uh, those guys uh, over there in uh, uh, New Orleans. They have a three-day assessment where they're, they're looking at SWIC guys and trying to help us out. So if you haven't been to Tulane, I encourage you to go. Uh, if you need their contact information, I have it. So just uh, hit me up, and I'd be happy to give it to you. Uh, if you're trying to do a uh, anything with the VA where you're trying to file a claim, uh, you need a, a SWIC occupational letter that, that shows our our job, what we did in the military, and how uh, it uh, causes traumatic brain injury. So uh, NSW Group 4 has a cog on that, so that's what you need to get a hold of. I have that info if you need it. There's my email if you want to contact me about anything in, in uh, this presentation. I'm on LinkedIn as well. And then uh, in regards to all the references, um, I have references for everything information-wise that I put out. So if anyone needs that kind of a reference to substantiate some of the uh, claims I've made, then by all means, ask for it. You can have it. And uh, 
No problem. All right. Thanks a lot. And uh, God bless.